Thank you. Um, so just to pick up on Debbie's point, I'm going to see, uh, take us and see how we get upstream um, to actually think about and set some of those um, issues and, and subjects up. Um, what I want to talk about is Yorkshire Worlds. Um, Yorkshire is God's greatest county. It's the greatest creation. Um, unfortunately, you're in the West Riding bit. We want you to go to the East Riding bit. Um, and we're going to look at a project we're funding your Garfield trust to do, which is to create a prudent research strategy for the Yorkshire Worlds, um, and um, they call it food for thought, um, there, there is a reason. Uh, if you catch me later, we've got a QR code for you, because we're, we're actually getting them to do some work by actually filling out a survey um, to actually ask you what you think about the Yorkshire Worlds, so you can actually see the work in action. Um, but what I want to do in doing it, we've been doing this work now for about nine months. And what has been interesting is we set a really specific agenda when we started this project, and that was it actually had to be open, and that it wasn't just going to be a bunch of archaeologists defining what the search strategy was. We wanted to try and do it differently, we wanted to explore different ways of doing it. And I must admit, when I, when I read all the tender returns, I, I, I nearly cried when I read the C, uh, the. Um, why AT1, because they got what we were asking, which was doing something totally different and asking the question in a different way. Uh, and since we started, um, the impact has already started to affect what we want to do at the end, uh, which is amazing. And one of those things is the conversations you start having. And I kid you not, part of the change is as a result of a snow plow. Okay? And uh, I'll come back to it later. But I think this is the most important archaeological artifact in the Yorkshire Worlds. <laughs> okay, why do we want to look at the Wolds? Well, uh, in 2008, we did the Heritage of Risk survey, which had the monuments at risk, and obviously, in the Yorkshire Wolds, what you actually find lots and lots of archaeology, plows, lots and lots of damaged archaeology, lots and lots of heritage at risk. Okay, so you have Nunnery Hill at the bottom, and you've got three photographs from 1946 to 2011, effectively, that site has almost entirely been eradicated. Okay, so a real challenge. When you look at the Shetland monuments, you just get mapped with lots of dots. Okay, why do we have lots of archaeology? Uh, because it's on chalk and it's really easy to spot, and probably really easy to schedule without actually having to go and do a site visit. Uh, there you go, simple as that. It's human decisions in everything we actually look at. But it's not just about the archaeology, this is a landscape full of designed landscapes that are really fascinating. This is the Birdsell estate, uh, it's full of lots of deserted medieval villages. On Percy, and it's also full of lots of activity. People love digging in this landscape. I'm absolutely convinced because it's a chalk landscape, it's really easy. Yeah, you don't have to go for any clay at all in this landscape. You can just put your spade in and out, it comes. Topsoil is only about six inches deep as well. So okay. dead easy to do all this archaeology. So there's lots of activity. But why are we interested? Well, in some senses, we're never going to stop cultivation in this landscape. Cultivation may change, but plowing has probably done about as much damage as it can do, and that's going to be sustained. And I was really concerned that our mentality in this landscape was just to complain about the stuff being at risk. And basically what I've said is, we really need a different approach, because actually it's not all at risk. How people live and work in this landscape isn't necessarily at risk. How we feel about this landscape isn't necessarily at risk. There's stuff we can do. How can we change this around? And in some senses, this is using a conservation principles approach, okay? Yes, the intellectual value might be at risk, but the communal value might be doing something else, the aesthetic value might be doing something else. How can we really explore where these things are? So we start with the research strategy. And there's a really good reason, because, you know, 100 years ago, this man, uh, Robert Mortimer, he spent 40 years digging archaeology in the world, sticking up barrows, hundreds of them, thousands of them, helped define what archaeology is today. The Yorkshire Wolves! help define what archaeology is today. How many of you know where the Yorkshire Wolves are, what the archaeology is there? It's almost one of the most you know, hidden gems we've actually got. But, you know, it's a fascinating, people live in this landscape and they do things, and it's a landscape of actually of innovation, and it's a landscape of change. This is a map of the Birdsell Estate. Right in the centre you've got the designed landscape, you then have the extended parkland, and then you have the wall tops. You can read it. And I've driven around the estate a lot. I've been around with the family, uh, the people who work for them, people who've lived with them, grown up on the estate. And what you actually find are the incredible stories when they start talking. So I took all our team out 
Okay, and we went to this barrow. Look at this lovely barrow. When you stand here and look out at this landscape, it's like being transported back in time. Ah, oh, design landscape expert said, so, sorry, not a barrow. You're actually standing on an 18th century viewing platform of a house. Excellent, I said. What a great question. Why don't we dig this barrow up and see who's right? See what the issue is, okay? But immediately change perception. Because again, how do we want to talk about this landscape? What are the questions we want to pose in them? I was taken to this farmstead. This farmstead's brilliant. It just here is the remains of a mill pond and a 19th century mill, but that mill is much older. Okay? You then get this small farmstead built next to it. And this is a classic 18th, 19th century um, farmstead with a barn and a fold yard. Okay? The purpose of this barn is to produce poo. Poo on an industrial scale. Cattle poo. Why? Because we need to fertilise the land. Okay? That's what they did here. So this, this landscape's all about innovation. So the land stops being productive, you create poo, you make the land productive. But actually what's really significant is this barn here. Because in there, there are a series of concrete pens. And that is where uh, Lord Middleton, the last Lord Middleton, introduced the current form of pig farm into this country. Okay, in that barn there, you can go and look at it and you can actually see the original pig size that he created in there. Okay, this family is all about innovation. Their current one are these brilliant little uh, mounds. They're, they're limestone mounds. And what they're doing here is they've created a breed of cattle that can be overwintered outside. Okay, what they do is they produce uh, a limestone mound, the cattle all gather around them, when they poo, Poo goes onto the top, the water flows off the side, and the, and the actual poo ends up being a radiator. It keeps them warm over winter, so they all stay outside. Here you go, that's a little bit more detail. That's a little bit more. Does anyone recognise what this might look like? Look at these ones, they have the cows on them. And lo and behold, there's your Bronze Age bowl barrow version. So, what an interesting thing. So, are all these barrows actually burial mounds? Maybe our ancestors were overwintering cattle in a really clever and inventive way. I don't believe that, okay? <laughs> but what it actually does, <laughs> what it does is it allows me to ask some interesting questions, not least, what will these look like in the future? Think about them. But it's all about innovation, it's about change. It's a brilliantly dynamic landscape. So part of the actual process is we've been out, we've been out asking people questions, lots and lots and lots of questions. We've had events, we've also set up study zones, because we can't, we can't afford to do the whole of the world. So we've chosen five study zones to start off with, and what's really interesting is guess where the study zones are, when you actually start putting all the questionnaires into word clouds. So we have a study zone at Flamborough on the coast, Garton, uh, which is a rural parish, Lonsborough, a designed landscape. We've chosen these, they've all got different messages. Driffield is an urban uh, landscape. So lots of different messages, and these things start throwing things out to us so you can throw them all together. And when you actually study these, which we're doing, there's some really brilliant messages and there are really some really brilliant ideas. We've also been around various food festivals. Okay, so this is Beverly Food Festival. This is uh, Driffield. Actually, I might have got that little wrong around. History is Driffield. Uh, the Wolves is Beverly. Okay, uh, Warren, that's the Molten Food Festival. That Warren, Warren's right next to it. And this is what you get overall. Okay, and the best thing on there I love is chips. <laughs> chips. Why chips? Okay, there's a village in the Wolves called Wetland. Okay. Wetland has the best fish and chip shop in the entire universe. Okay. Why? Because it is 45 minutes from the coast. It is the exact point where kids nag their parents enough to stop to eat something okay. on their way back to the West Riding, okay. on their way back to Leeds. Because, of course, what you actually find about this landscape is all about itinerancy. Either it's itinerant workers or it's itinerant tourists. Each mill town in in West Yorkshire has a specific holiday week when they're on holiday called Wet Week, and they all bugger off to the coast. And now they go all by car and they all stop at Wet Wang on the way home. Okay? So if you learn any fiction chip shop, it's the one in Wet Wang. Now, part of actually doing this process, we uh, in these groups, um, your park is called Justin, and primarily their, their, their community board, Jen Jackson, brilliant, right? She got everyone to do a mood board to bring stuff. And one of the groups brought this, they basically brought what they produced from the community uh, art, art and archaeology projects. And um, it was just it was just sitting there and, and it was 
that's amazing, and I'm just going to show it to you because it blew my mind away. And basically, what they've been doing in the past four years is an excavation of a scheduled monument called Hanging Rinsford. I knew they were doing this excavation, actually run by one of my colleagues. Okay? We just knew they were just doing some archaeology. What we didn't know is they were producing some of this material. So, here is the deserted medieval village, everyone will recognise that. This is what one of the community made. So that is a photograph printed onto a piece of cloth and then using quilting techniques. They made it three-dimensional. I'm touched. It's just awesome, right? Let's just quickly flip through that. That's it again. There it is there. Wow! Look at that. That's incredible. Right, they found some clay, so they made some pots. Yeah, they had a, they had a, a potter in the village and they just enjoyed themselves. Just going and exploring, actually, where it might go. This is the same group. And someone made this. This is a book. Okay? This is a book. Open up the book. And there's a record of their time on the excavation. You just keep opening it up, all four slides, until you then get this in the middle. And in that little red book there, you have a fine label for each of those things. So they've got their own little portable museum. <coughs> Absolutely brilliant. I just think it's fascinating. There you go. Look at that. Wow. This is the well on site. Uh, same member of the community embroidered it. Didn't just embroider it, stuck it on top of a box, inside the box, and made a whole load of little artifacts that they kept. What they're doing is telling the stories of myths. The wells are where myths are stored. Okay? And so they actually made all these stories come out in the box and how they wanted to talk about it. Now, we, at one of the events, I finally asked, why did you do all this? And their response was really interesting. They said, when we were doing the excavation and we thought about the ancestors, our ancestors who lived here, we had all these feelings about what they must have been, about how they were living. And the archaeologists, they didn't want us to have those feelings. So we went away and we created all this stuff to capture what our feelings were. And I'm like, what? No! I'm not going to have feelings. We don't have feelings. What's the point of doing it? Okay? So it was they just absolutely represented what we we're trying to do. So much so that we put a project variation in and we've got some more money to do a whole series of community authored projects to ground the research strategy. Okay, to show people actually what they can do, all right? And so we're going to be exploring actually how we actually do that and what, that, what it actually means. Why my snow plow? Well, again, let's move back to the birds of the state with the farmstead just then that they took me to. And there it is. And here is the farmstead. They took me there because we were talking about what to do with all their farms, because they're mainly redundant now. And they told me that the tenant and his family had just moved out of this farm. Okay. He still works on the estate, but they moved out for a very specific reason, because their kids became teenagers, and they became really fed up about not having the internet, and having to travel 10 miles every day to go to school, there and back. And the wife was a nurse and worked in the local town. So basically, the entire family, four of them, were travelling to the town every day, whilst the dad was staying on the farm and farm. Okay. So they decided to flip it around. Okay. So they moved to the local town, and the dad returned to this estate. Okay. They left one item behind, which they owned in their outlet. That was a snow plow. Why is that interesting? What that actually shows is the world isn't an easy landscape to live in. It's not an easy landscape to be successful in. It's not an easy landscape to farm. Why are all those things important? Because they all help us frame the questions we might want to ask about the archaeology and how easy was it to live in this landscape. If you Talk to anyone, they'll all mention water in this landscape and what water actually means and how difficult it is. But it's absolutely fascinating. This, this landscape's on our doorstep, yet it's almost entirely remote when you actually get into it. People drive through it, but they don't necessarily stop in it. What might we do to about that? We then met Yorker Wildlife Trust because I'm constantly always trying to think what the legacy of the research strategy might be. And I took my science advisor along with me, and she was really brilliant, and I just thought she was going to talk about sciencey things all day, and she just said, do you know what, I really want to see some comments from the wildlife trust. She goes, the thing I really want questions about are barn owls. And I'm like, what? Why are we going to get barn owls from? She goes, well, of course, if we can understand what the human is, the, the, the bone remains of the art of barn owls might be, we can start asking questions about how agricultural systems might change. And in one sentence, she captivated the guy from the Orca Wildlife Trust so much so that they really want to work with us now get a legacy from this, make sure their questions are in this. One question did that, that was amazing. I was so happy I made this picture for it. 
Yeah. Because it was impact. It really meant something. She found a question that made relationships. And that's it. So what is my one thing about your world? Do you know what? I don't want any answers from it. Okay? But the most important thing about any question we ask doing this are the five questions we get back again. Because with the five questions, I can get another five questions and another five questions. And when you start multiplying those up, you get all the activity that we've been talking about and all the engagement that we actually really want. And that's the your well, search strategy. Come to our table, fill out our questionnaire, and if you want to have some more impact, you can come along for the session I'm doing tomorrow about what makes us have a real impact in the work we do. Thanks.